Uh, thank you very much. The, uh, of course, I'm getting a little notorious for my argument that Shakespeare was not really the guy we're told he was, who was probably really called Shakespeare, Stratford on Avon, England, but rather the Earl of Oxford, the 17th Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. Now, my talk today doesn't bear on the authorship question very much. I just mention it uh, tangentially. I'm finishing a book this weekend, I hope, called Outing Shakespeare, <laughs> in which I argue not only that Oxford was the real author, but the part of the reason he, Edward de Vere, uh, couldn't acknowledge his authorship was that he was in love with another man. Uh, the Earl of Southampton, to whom several of the works are dedicated. And so, taking a leap from the gay rights movement, I like to say, he's here, he's queer, he's Edward de Vere. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. <clears throat> Excuse me, well, the... Uh, And that bears very little on the question of war and empire in the works of Shakespeare. So I'm using Shakespeare the way we use Mark Twain. You know, when, when we say Mark Twain, we mean Clemens, and when I say Shakespeare, I mean Edward de Vere or whoever. And I'm certain it's de Vere, but I'll save that for another day. The um, One of the... Striking things about the works of Shakespeare is, of course, their real, I hate the word nowadays, diversity. It used to be a good word. But he seems to cover everything, and he seems to be hard to pin down. He, we've, Shakespeare's always been a very elusive writer, in a way. Um, it's not easy to say Shakespeare believes such and such the way you can say John Milton or Dante, or even Virgil believes such and such. There's a, there's a quality about Shakespeare that, well, it's, it's a kind of Catholicity. It's called his universality quite often. I think that's stretching a point. He's vast, but he's not universal. And I think one of the, one of the things my book will achieve, if it succeeds, is to show Shakespeare as an individual. Now, there's another, there's another author, um, there's a, whose work is usually published in these two volumes called Harold Goddard, who I think is the greatest of Shakespeare critics. It doesn't deal at all with the Shakespeare authorship question. It deals solely with the plays. And he has, I think, come closest of any orthodox Shakespeare critic to getting the uh, essence of Shakespeare's particular outlook on life and making Shakespeare an individual again instead of just this towering, vague genius in the clouds. One of the remarkable things about Shakespeare is the uh, it's found in the play Troilus and Cressida. It's set in the Trojan War, of course. The Trojan War was the one war that every educated man would know of, an educated Elizabethan would know more about the Trojan War than he would about English history. Because the one book, one secular book, that every educated man knew for sure was Virgil's Aeneid. And, and in uh, book two, the fall of Troy is recounted. Of course, there were many other books. It was the central myth of the classical world. And a classical educate well, an education in those days was a classical education. Well, Shakespeare took that great theme in Troilus and Cressida and wrote maybe the most debunking account ever of the Trojan War. It, it does not glorify the war in any way. In fact, the spokesman, for, if Shakespeare has a spokesman in that play, it may be the vile character Thersites, who says, wars and lechery, still wars and lechery. That's all it is to him. So the, the, this extremely, not only unromantic, but anti-romantic view of the Trojan War seems to be Shakespeare's. On the other hand, the one Shakespeare play that 
at least a generation ago, uh, most people were likely to have encountered, if only through the movies, is Henry V. And Henry V is always, almost always, treated as a glorification of war, specifically of Henry's invasion of France culminating in the Battle of Agincourt. Here Goddard, I think, is extremely profound and searching and original and restores Shakespeare's real intentions. He was dealing with a national hero, Henry V, uh, who in the popular mind I suppose looks like uh, Laurence Olivier in the role, maybe somewhat uh, Kenneth Branagh now. How many of you, by the way, have seen the Olivier version of Henry V? How many have seen Branagh's version more recently? Okay, good. The um, Both plays miss what Goddard cites as the great ironies of Shakespeare's version. Uh, Olivier's version was intended as a kind of morale booster and propaganda film during World War II. The, uh, you know, the, the poor beleaguered English, as they're shown in that film, are supposed to be like the poor beleaguered English of World War II. There's a slight difference that the movie overlooks, which is that the poor beleaguered English are in somebody else's country. <laughs> and that's, that's the clue to Shakespeare's real attitude toward this whole expedition. We have to remember that Henry V was the culmination of uh, a great tetralogy that began with Richard II, and continued in both parts of King Henry IV. Henry IV, the father of Henry V, was originally uh, Henry Bolingbroke, who overthrew Richard II and was a usurper. And so the, his whole uh, line here has a bad conscience about the origins of their title to the English throne. It's, it's typical of Shakespeare that, as Goddard says, he doesn't force his ironies on you. He just puts them there, and you can very easily miss them. For example, at the end of Henry IV, Part I, the partisans of Mortimer are put down. He's the other claimant to the throne, the one who uh, had Richard's blessing. And so the, um, the, the quote, well, of course, Henry IV calls them rebels. He would, because he claims to be legitimate. They don't think they're rebels at all because they don't think he's legitimate. So at the end of the play, when Henry's forces have won, the first line in the very last scene is Henry's gloating, thus ever did rebellion find rebuke. He has a short memory. His rebellion didn't find rebuke. Well, that's how it goes. In, in Henry IV, part two then, as he's dying, having suppressed yet another uprising, uh, he urges his son, who is shortly to be Henry V, to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. Advice that shrewd statesmen have used ever since, and a line I hope doesn't occur to Bill Clinton in the near future. <laughs> the, um, the brother of Henry, at the end of Henry IV, part two, uh, says that, yes, I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard a bird so sing, whose music, to my thinking, pleased the king. So the play ends with this hint that there will be a sequel in France, which the epilogue confirms. Okay, now we come to Henry V. The play opens, of course, with this famous chorus, which the, the chorus whose one man comes out and apologizes to us for the inadequacy of what we're about to see on this poor wooden stage. Now, we can't really, he's saying we can't really reproduce the glory of Agincourt on this lousy stage here, but please let, indulge us with your imagination. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention 
a kingdom for a sage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Well, it's interesting. Famine, sword, and fire are to be Henry's greyhounds. The, um, the play continues, the play begins actually with the two prelates, the Bishop of Ely and the Archbishop of Canterbury, worrying that the king is about to tax them. So in order to avoid confiscation of church properties, they decide to offer him something to divert him, his giddy mind as it were. They're going to offer him a pretext for invading France. They know this is on his mind, and they cook up a claim to the throne of France for Henry. <coughs> now, on the surface, the, plays, the play celebrates Henry, but if you look closer, as Goddard points out, you find it's not doing that in any unambiguous way at all. There's a lot of irony waiting here to be noticed. When the archbishop comes to court, Henry greets him and, and asks him to justify this claim of his, if he can, under the French uh, Salic law, which forbids any woman from succeeding to the throne. That affects the genealogy in a very complicated way, and he thinks can justify his claim. My learned lord, we pray you to proceed, says Henry. And justly and religiously unfold why the law Salic that they have in France, or should or should not bar us in our claim. And God forbid, my dear and faithful Lord, that you should fashion, rest, or bow your reading, or nicely charge your understanding soul with opening titles miscreate, whose right sorts not in native colors with the truth. For God doth know how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore take heed how you impawn our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in the name of God, take heed. For never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood, whose guiltless drops are every one a woe, a sore complaint against him whose wrongs give edge unto the swords, that makes such waste and brief mortality. Under this conjuration, speak, my lord, for we will hear, note, and believe in heart that what you speak is in your conscience washed as pure as sin with baptism. The Archbishop of Canterbury then proceeds to deliver what is by all odds the most boring speech in Shakespeare. <laughs> he goes through all the technicalities of Salic law and reviews the history of the succession of France and you know, after this tremendously involved uh, explanation, concludes, so that as clear as is the summer sun, <laughs> then, uh, you are entitled to be king of France, in short. Well, the line always gets a laugh. Sometimes they try not to make it laughable, but it is, it's meant to be laughable. These ironies were not lost on Shakespeare. He wrote this play. So... Uh, I mean, he has a pretty good sense of audience reaction. Well, Henry's claim, then, has some kind of pretext here. It's extremely technical. It's interesting to note that his claim to France, uh, shaky as it is, is not much shakier than his claim to the throne of England, which is pretty obviously shaky. And he himself knows this and admits it later on in the play, as we'll see. But... Um, at any rate, the, of course, our, our concern isn't here with the, uh, his claim to the title. It's the pretext for war. And he keeps appealing to God all the time. Henry keeps saying, Now are we well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, will bend it to our awe or break it all to pieces. And so on. And then comes in the French ambassador. Now, Henry, mind you, Henry has already decided to go to war. And you may re recall the scene that follows next. 
the French ambassador comes in with a gift of tennis balls to make fun of Henry's wild youth. And he's a little unsure whether Henry is going to uh, you know, shoot the messenger, as it were, if he tells him his mission. And so he asks him, is it okay if I show you, present this gift to you? You won't be angry? And Henry says, we are no tyrant, but a Christian king, <laughs> unto whose grace our passion is a subject, as is our wretches fettered in our prisons. Therefore, with frank and with uncurbed plainness, tell us the daughter's mind. They open it up. He says, what treasure, uncle? His uncle, Ex the Earl of Exeter, says, tennis balls, my liege. <laughs> Henry does one of the great slow burns in drama. <laughs> we are glad the dolphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set, shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. <laughs> Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well how he comes o'er us with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them, and so on. And he, but then he says, Again, with that great sanctimony typical of Henry. Until the pleasant prince, this mock of his, have turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charted for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down. And I, some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the dauphin's scorn. But this lies all within the will of God. <laughs> this, this is, that's, that's the real Henry touch, you know. Just uh, he and uh, uh, he'd make a good U.S. president. Uh, finally, he concludes, his jests will savor but of shallow wit when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. But always the appeal to God, always the, the sanctimony. Now, he'd already decided to make war on France when the tennis balls came. But when that insulting gift arrives, he, he is really driven to a rage, and yet uses that as a justification, a pretext, and a provocation to war. So evidently, he doesn't feel that his title is enough. He acts insulted in order to... I'll give even more color to this sorry venture. He sends his uncle Exeter ahead to the French court where he promises that if they don't simply vacate the throne and yield it to Henry right away, there will be widows' tears, orphans' cries, dead men's blood, pining maidens' groans, and so on. Now, also in the play uh, are scenes that don't work very well in the modern uh, productions, and they're the comic scenes in between, the low characters who seem to parody Henry with their bravado, their threats and bluster and uh, cries of, for example, Captain McMorris, the Irish captain, when he feels he's been insulted by the Welshman, says, so Christ save me, I will cut off your head. Well, that's a nice promise. Uh, but it's, again, it's a kind of a parody of Henry. When Henry comes to Harfleur, he urges the governor of the town to surrender or else. He says, If I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved Harfleur till in her ashes she lie buried. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up, and the flesh soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hand, shall range with conscience wide as hell. Mowing like grass, your fresh, fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is it then to me, if impious war, arrayed in flames like to the prince of fiends, do with his smirched complexion all fell feats and link to war and desolation? What is to me, when you yourselves are cause, if your fair maidens fall into the hand of hot and forcing violation? 
What rain can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career? We may as ruthless spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil, as send precepts to the Leviathan to come ashore. Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people. As yet my soldiers are in my command. As yet the cool and temperate wind of grace o'erblows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil, and villainy. If not, why in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill, shrieking daughters, your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls, your naked infants spitted upon pipes, whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused to break the clouds as did the wise of Jewry at Herod's bloody hunting slaughterman. What say you? Will you yield and disavoid, or guilty in defense, be thus destroyed? They give up. <laughs> right away. So, this is what the chorus of the play calls the mirror of all Christian kings. And, and Goddard, I think, rightly, suspects Shakespeare of having his audience on a little. The, um, the, 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 there's the famous scene around the fire where Henry appears to his soldiers in disguise and tells them that war is God's beetle. War is his vengeance. So that the people, so he takes a very optimistic view of war, that war simply punishes the wicked who deserve it, the ones who have it coming. It's not the king's fault. Is always wriggling out of responsibility. Then at the end of that scene, he has the soliloquy in which he laments that everyone always blames the king for everything. My kings have it rough. Uh, he's the son of a man who gave us the line, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Well, he's certainly his father's son. Upon the king. That is our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all, O oh, hard condition, twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool, whose sense no more can feel but his own ringing. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? They've just been talking to the private men. They're scared stiff. You know, they're terrified. The slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it, but in gross brain little knows what watch the king keeps to maintain the peace, whose hour is the peasant best advantages. Now, how can anyone miss the uh, clear irony here? He's saying the slave enjoys the peace which the king works so hard to maintain. He's saying this in France, where he's just brought these guys on the most absurd pretexts to support his claim to the throne of France. He then prays, O God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. And at the end of that prayer, he promises that he will he'll build chantries where priests will perpetually um, pray for the soul of Richard, whom his father has deposed. So there again we see Shakespeare is well aware of how shaky this is. Well, this is Shakespeare's treatment of this great national hero of England, Henry V. He's, oh, and he, conc he concludes the play on this note. Um, Thus far with rough and all unable pen, this is the chorus speaking, not necessarily the author, our bending author hath pursued the story in little room confining mighty men mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small most greatly lived the star of England, fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden he achieved, and, left, uh, and of it left his son, imperial lord. Henry the Sixth, an infant band's crowned king of France and England, did this king succeed, whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed which oft our stage hath shown, which is a reference to the Henry VI plays in which Shakespeare has already shown the chaos that ensued in England after Henry's conquest, first wars in France, then civil war at home, 
This was the upshot of this imperial venture of Henry V. So, uh, as Mark, as Huck Finn says, well, kings is kings and you have to make allowances. Uh, and Shakespeare, whoever he was, did, but he had no illusions about them. Now, it's interesting that after four centuries, we've had only a very few critics who've discerned the irony here and who've found what I think is pretty clearly Shakespeare's true intent. Now, you couldn't just have a play showing Henry V as a lousy king, as a bloody usurper and murderer and everything. About the only way you could speak the truth about Henry V in that day is the way Shakespeare manages to do it. By showing Henry superficially as this glorious conqueror, and there are a lot of great stirring speeches, of course, but, um, and the chorus tells you the sort of popular view of Henry, but that is not the author's view. He has to be very subtle about it, and he is, but it's all there. So much so that when they make these movies, they have to soften these things. First, they, they cut out these bloodiest speeches, like the big one at Harfleur I read you, where he threatens the, uh, the girls, the old men, and even the infants. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes, the mirror of all Christian kings. Well, that had to go, of course, when Olivier is doing his movie. He's trying to turn the English into victims. Did a very good job. Um, and then, uh, okay, Olivier, great actor, but he, boy, he, he shouldn't have been allowed near Shakespeare, I sometimes think. He, he always missed the point of, of a play one way or another. Uh, did you ever see his Hamlet? How many have seen his, his Hamlet? Yeah, he, he sticks all that Freudian stuff in. Uh, Hamlet's always smooching with his mother while the king is talking Shakespeare. <laughs> You know, I like to say it was a real now movie then, and it's a real then movie now. <laughs> it's precisely the things they put in to make it seem up to date that date it fastest. Shakespeare goes on. Uh, and it's, there's something so kind of eternal about him. Uh, also, they added great heroics in the Olivier version. You saw Henry in battle. Shakespeare never shows Henry fighting. It tells you how heroic the expedition is, but he never fights, never lifts a sword. He only, he only orders the prisoners' throats cut. Uh, that kind of thing. Kenneth Branagh did something even Olivier hadn't done. There's a scene in which Bardolph, one of Henry's old friends from his wild youth, is caught robbing a church, and Henry orders him hanged as an example so that the French people won't be too uh, alarmed. You know, he has to keep his forces uh, in, in some kind of discipline. So they, they hang Bardolph, his old friend, at his command. And in the Brada movie, Henry is just weeping, tears streaming down his face as he watches his old friend hung up. There is nothing whatever in the text to suggest that Henry is in any way sorry. It's a completely cold-blooded act. And, uh, uh, well, anyway, there, there's, a, there's a lot more to support this interpretation, but I think this is enough to make it clear that Shakespeare is not buying this heroic view of war and conquest that the English generally bought, and I'm afraid still do. Uh, Shakespeare became a great imperial propaganda tool, but only because his point in this play in particular could be misrepresented so easily. In fact, that his point could be missed so easily. I think you, you could even view Antony and Cleopatra as a kind of epilogue to Henry V, in a way. That's why I think of our lately departed great Russell Kirk here, because Russell was a man who preferred beauty to power. And I think that's Shakespeare's philosophy in a nutshell, if you can put something so vast as his outlook into a nutshell. And that's what I think Antony and Cleopatra is about. Antony isn't interested in maintaining an empire. For him, it's the world well lost for love. It's um, 
Uh, he announces it right at the beginning. Uh, let Rome and Tiber melt and the wide arch of the ranged empire fall. Here is my space. Kissing Cleopatra, he says, the nobleness of life is to do thus. That's Shakespeare. I think you can specify his attitude. I think he hated violence and war, saw them as sometimes necessary, but rarely justified in the way that the, the way they're executed in this world. And uh, again, I can I can only recommend to you this wonderful study by Harold Goddard, which I think takes us closer to the heart of Shakespeare than any other critic has. So, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer. First of all, we don't know anything about the original productions because we have only a few, you know, uh, recorded entries for performances of any Shakespeare play and very, very few descriptions of the... He's a very erratic scholar. Um, in his book, Reinventing Shakespeare, he does make one point I think is terrific, and that is that Shakespeare became this propaganda tool for the British Empire. And, in fact, we owe to that some of his exaltation. I think he deserves to be exalted as he is. I think he's the greatest writer in the world, with, you know, a couple of... <laughs> uh, except maybe for Homer, Virgil, or Dante. I don't know who else there is in his league. But um, he wasn't a big deal in England for a long time, nearly two centuries. And in, uh, in fact, it wasn't until 1740 that any Shakespeare play was translated into another European language. Shakespeare was a pretty local phenomenon for a long time. And uh, anyway, the the uh, I, I know there are those who there, there are those who take a different view, knowing Goddard's view, but uh, I still think Goddard gives the fullest interpretation I've seen. Right. Well, I think there is even in that speech. He says, "And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves." A oh wait, no. And this is uh, he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. That is, anyone who sheds his blood with Henry today will be a gentleman. No matter, no matter how vile his condition, that is, how lowly his status, he'll be a, I'll elevate him to the status of gentleman. He doesn't do it. There again, another broken campaign promise. <laughs> But, well, what performance? Well, Goddard agrees with that. Goddard would agree with that. Look, he says, look, Shakespeare gives you both. He gives you the whole experience of it. And the ironies are in there. It's not, it's not that the... The irony is everything. The irony, though, is the the underside of it. This is what you this is what you find last. He says you should enjoy it at that level first. No. This is not to say you should be sitting there in the theater trying to penetrate, you know, to the deepest meanings. You can't in the theater. And I don't think these plays were written solely for the theater, as witnessed the fact that most of the mature plays, the later plays, 
have never worked as well in the theater as the early and middle plays. Thank you. subversion in the sense of, of aiming at some ultimate ef uh, political effect. I think it's just a matter of Shakespeare keeping his head and inviting you to do it too. He says, you know, Hamlet says, um, that, um, you know, the purpose of drama is to hold the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image. In the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Now this overdone or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of the which one must in your allowance or away a whole theater of others. So it's a very aristocratic view of the, of the theater. And you aim at that ideal audience, you say. Not, at, not just at the approval of the mob. So... I think, I think he puts the subtleties there. For one thing, I don't think he was merely a commercial playwright. I do think that he was a man who didn't have to make a living at this and could afford to put his, his whole heart into it because he wasn't just beating deadlines and making a buck. Um, yeah, Tom? The, uh, I, I think that the young lady deserves a, a more candid answer. I mean, what if Shakespeare were perceived as writing a pen? We know what happens under those circumstances in Elizabeth's England. You go to jail, you get your you know, nose slit off, you, you, you will find yourself either robbing in jail if you're lucky or put to death. Now, if Elizabethan England is not a place where you can treat the royal mythology lightly. That's true, that's a good and, point. And secondly, I wonder, if, you know, all these oh, the, the terrible things that England do to the brain. Wouldn't that be cause for exaltation in the Elizabethan audience? That's the right give it to them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that strikes me that, that most of the ironies there would not have been perceived as ironies in the Mm, Well, it depends who was perceiving, though. That's well, the... I, 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 not us. Not, he didn't write for us. He wrote, he wrote for a middle class audience in, uh, in London. He for us. But they were Christians. We no longer may believe that, but certainly in the uh, in, in, uh, in Shakespeare's time, they certainly believe. And, and by the way, it's not, his claim is not all about technical. Uh, I mean, it, it's, no, it's no more technical than, than the French king or the Dauphin. I mean, he, he, and the, he, he has uh, he's a Frenchman just as they are. And then they, we see, it, 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 it's a time in which nature and order is being established, and Shakespeare certainly is dimly aware of that. Hmm. Well, the. Uh... I, well, I just, I'll recommend again Goddard's analysis of the Archbishop's speech, which I think is just one of the most brilliant passages of Shakespeare criticism I've ever read, in which he debunks, debunks it, 
and uh, appeals to the theatrical value too, in a way. Sir? There, yeah, there again, see, Goddard changed my whole view of Shakespeare, I must say. I threw him across the room first, at least I threw his book across the room I, <laughs> when I first read it. Uh, it was so provoking to me. But, uh, well, first of all, Fortinbras's name means strong arm. He stands for power. And some people contend that he is the, uh, is the ideal, the sort of happy mean between Hamlet and Laertes. I don't think so. I think that the point, the point of the play is summed up in the lines of, if, yeah, it's oversimplifying it horribly, but something like a key to the play is in the play, the player king speech, what to ourselves in passion we propose, the passion ending that the purpose lose. That's a, I've often thought of it as a kind of Hayekian play. We can't control we can't control the consequences too much. We can't know the consequences fully. And when we act in passion, uh, we set off things whose end we have no idea. <laughs> and that's Hamlet's tragedy. He feels he has to do this to be true to his father. But the result is the destruction of the dynasty. And, and it's takeover by the enemy, Fortinbras, the recent enemy. How would I talk? 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 And he was exalted as a national hero. There was a great craze for Sidney right away. And he remained, he has remained to this day in the pantheon of English heroes. So is Henry. Well, of course, that was a different kind of war. That was not just a, a, a dynastic war, a war over, uh, over territory. It was part of a, you know, part of the semi-religious war with Spain. Um, Anyway, I don't, I don't think Shakespeare is commenting on that directly. There are indirect comments on Sidney himself in Shakespeare, but I don't think that bears on Henry V. When you the you Yes, well, he, he was, yeah, he was, um, uh, De Vere, Oxford was, a quite capable a fighter himself, and, and one uh, in you know in, in their version of the Olympics, he won in the justing. Uh, he was a mean man with a lance. Now he did also have military commissions in uh, on several occasions and wanted to fight against Spain, but was recalled. So uh, you know this is not to say Shakespeare was always anti-war, but he knew what. I think because Oxford knew what war was that we find Shakespeare uh, taking the view he does of war. There was someone over here. I thought, okay, I guess I satisfactorily answered all curiosity on the subject. Okay, thank you.